Welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Mike Phillips. Ayana, I, I came to wonder if, if all these many years, these decades, these centuries, Mother Earth has been howling to us, hoping for us to respond by affirming her importance, hoping for us to respond by rising up in the defense of the defenseless parts of nature. Mike has served as the executive director of the Turner Endangered Species Fund and advisor to the Turner Biodiversity Divisions since he co-founded both with Ted Turner in June 1997. Prior to that, Mike has worked for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and National Park Service since 1981. During his employment with the Department of Interior, Mike served as the leader of historic efforts to restore red wolves to the southeastern U.S. and gray wolves to Yellowstone National Park. He also conducted important research on the impacts of oil and gas development on grizzly bears in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge predation costs for gray wolves in Alaska, black bear movements in northeastern North Carolina, and dingo ecology in Australia. In 2006, Mike was elected to the Montana legislature, where he served as the representative for House District 66 in Bozeman until 2012, where he was elected to the Montana Senate. Welcome to the show, Mike. I feel so grateful to be connecting with you today as a fellow conservationist so deeply immersed in this work. Oh, Ayana, it is very much my privilege and my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, within these circles, we often organize and orient around the notion of sustaining life. And in preparing for this interview, I was immediately struck by the way you speak and write about the biological necessity of death. In an interview with Mountain and Prairie podcast, you share, quote, all of life that we see around us, the fantastic forms so well adapted to local challenges, are a function of death. Evolution drives by death, end quote. And what has drawn you to build lifelong alliances with predators like the coyote and the gray wolf, so-called deliverers of death? And in your answer, perhaps you could also speak to the depth that these species bring to our ecological systems and the phenomenon of trophic cascades. My work with coyotes many years ago back, heaven's sakes, it would have been the early 1980s. uh, A wolf researcher by the name of Dave Meach uh, said to me, I don't have any room on my field crew right now. I suggest that you go study coyotes. Uh, Back in the early 1980s, gray wolves were very, very uncommon in the United States. There were only uh, maybe a thousand gray wolves in northeastern Minnesota. That that was it. So Dave's program was the only game in town if you wanted to work with gray wolves. So I took Dave's advice to heart and conducted a study of coyote food habits in Illinois and and published that study. And as soon as I did that, uh, within about a year, I went right back to Dr. Beach and I said, okay, well, you did exactly what you told me to do. Now do you have an opening? And he did. That was in 1981 that I began working with Dave and and Ayana. I've had the good fortune to work on wolf recovery and conservation and research on a near daily basis ever since. The reason that wolves made so much sense to me as a lens for examining opportunities to contribute The wolf is a fantastic species for illuminating all sorts of problems that are only at best tangentially related to the gray wolf. Wolf recovery, wolf restoration, wolf research is always about more than than gray wolves. Wolves can be almost in many ways viewed as a trim tab. You may not know what a trim tab is, but many years ago, I learned how to fly small aircraft anticipating working in remote country where working out of a plane was sometimes essential. A trim tab is a device in the plane that gives you a mechanical advantage over portions of the wing uh, to make the wing behave properly so the plane can be flown properly. There's such great force uh, over the wings. You you need a mechanical advantage, a system of pulleys, to be able to move the wing and manage the wing in a fashion that allows the plane to perform properly. It's the trim tab 
that allows you that control. A small movement of the trim tab can create a great opportunity for the plane. A small movement with wolf recovery can create a great opportunity for conservation in general. Gray wolves are a wonderful way for examining our relationship with Mother Earth, which has been clearly out of whack for a long, long time. And once we come to accept that fact, then we're on the road to finding a new relationship going forward where it's possible, I think, and impossible to imagine peace, prosperity, and justice for more of human life and, uh, at least for me, non-human life, which is essential too. Now, on the trophic cascades, well, gee whiz, as I said in that Mountain Prairie podcast, it is true that the wondrous diversity of life that we see all around us is a function of all of that life trying to stay one step ahead of death. And so we know predation matters. Predation is the process whereby death is delivered. So if you're a predator, like a gray wolf, and you exist by delivering death, you have to matter. You have to matter in an evolutionary sense because it, it is death that sort of sits at the knife's edge of, of evolution, improving form so they can better stay one step ahead of death. Specifically with gray wolves, there are very good studies that show that if wolves are common enough for a long enough period of time, their predatory activities will lead to a, a change in the system, principally by reducing the number of ungulates in an area. Ungulates, of course, are not just hoofed mammals, deer and elk and moose of ungulates. If wolf predation can reduce their numbers, if wolf predation can cause them to behave differently, forage differently, those changes in numbers and behavior on the part of the ungulates can bring about system-wide changes in the ecology of a setting. That's fundamentally all a trophic cascade means, is that the, the activity of one level of the trophic system, the gray wolf would be one level of the food system, the trophic system, its activities can create a cascading effect to all the other levels. If elk in Yellowstone National Park, as an example, if elk are, are less common, that provides an opportunity for willows and aspen to experience a release. When the willows and aspens grow big, tall, and healthy, that creates lots of opportunities for other members of the system like pasture and birds and beavers. And of course, the birds and the beavers operate and, and exist at a different level of the trophic system. So gray wolf predation can create this cascading effect that spills through the food chain, that spills through the trophic system, thereby creating greater ecological resiliency and integrity. But for gray wolves to operate as those ecological engineers affecting a trophic cascade, they have to be fairly common and they have to be in place for an extended period of time. And, and so really the take home message from trophic cascades isn't gray wolves. No, that's not the case. Lots of things serve as predators, cougars and black bears and grizzly bears and coyotes. They're all important predators too. The important part of a trophic cascade that we should touch on today is predation. Predation delivered by all of these species that make a living by killing things. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mike, for explaining trophic cascades so beautifully. I could imagine the ecosystem well, as simply. you spoke. <laughs> simply. Uh, sim yeah. Simply. <laughs> that's, the, that's the best way for me to view things. It's simple. Mm -hmm. And the systems are exceedingly complicated, but the fundamentals are, are pretty simple. Mm -hmm. If life matters, then death matters. If mm -hmm. prey matter, then predators matter. It really is just that simple. Mm. I'd like to dive into the conservation and restoration work you've done over the years with gray wolves, particularly within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And to begin, I think it could be helpful to ground our listeners in the history of this great species that once thrived in abundance across the so-called United States. I imagine the nearly 250,000 to 500,000 wild wolves that used to roam freely across the lower 48 states later reduced to the brink of extinction in the 1950s, with numbers dipping into the low 300s. So could you share with us the story of the gray wolf, illuminating the differences between the vilified mythic wolf and the adaptive, powerful creature that you've come to know? 
Sure. I, I did. I need to listen more carefully. But did you say historically 200 to 500,000 gray wolves in the United States? That's what I was reading. Mm-hmm. Quarter of a million to half sure. a million. No, I would guess. Yeah, I would guess there were far more than that, hmm. which makes this story even more compelling. Gray wolves were historically one of the most widely distributed large mammals in, in North America. You could find gray wolves everywhere from coast to coast, east to west and north to south. You could find gray wolves in the grasslands, you could find them in the forests, you could find them in the deserts, you could find them in the swamps. You could find gray wolves everywhere where there was something bigger than themselves to eat. A fundamental difference between coyotes and gray wolves is based on their food habits. Coyotes are, on average, designed to kill things smaller than themselves. It doesn't mean that a coyote won't, on occasion, kill a deer. But on average, they're subsisting on items that are smaller than themselves. In contrast, the gray wolf is designed physically, socially, intellectually, designed to kill things bigger than itself. Doesn't mean that a gray wolf won't kill a snowshoe hare on occasion, but it does mean that gray wolves are hardwired to kill things bigger than themselves. Because of that, they were seen as a direct threat to the settling of the United States. Part of the manifest destiny that guided the settling of this country was that the wild places and wild things that early settlers encountered had to be subdued. They had to be commanded so that they could be tamed and controlled, so that the landscape provided in a more predictable manner those things that the settlers wanted. Uh, We should find it quite intriguing that the settlers took what is arguably one of the greatest assemblages of mammalian biomass the world has ever produced in the form of the plains bison. They took that tremendous abundance of life and drove it to the brink of extinction. The massacre of the bison is a tremendously sad story in the history of this country. You know what they did with the what, what they did in response? They replaced the bison with European cattle. They took this most common large mammal, a fantastic herbivore, and replaced it with what is, without doubt, an exotic species from Europe. All of the cattle that were used to settle this country came from Europe after the native bison had been nearly completely destroyed. Now, it is true, a massacred bison is a way to promote the subjugation of Native Americans as well. But that was all part and parcel of settling the big wild landscape that was the United States back in the day. Part of that was also creating an opportunity to command gray wolves to to near zero. And so the the gray wolves were subjected to a a war, a war that lasted, oh my Lord, I honor the war and the gray wolf lasted well over 200 years. It was a war that was fought with the most murderous means. And as the war ended, by the late 1950s, a war that began in the late 1600s, ended by the late 1950s, you could find this most common large mammal, the gray wolf, only in northeastern Minnesota, represented by a few hundred individuals and a few animals, 10, 12, 15 animals, on Isle Royale National Park in Lake Superior. We purposely took this most common large mammal, the gray wolf, and purposely drove it to the brink of extinction. Things improved, uh, admittedly, in the mid-1970s with passage of the Endangered Species Act in 1973. The gray wolf is one of the first species listed under that most important federal law. The listing brought forth recovery programs that eventually led to the restoration of gray wolves in the northern Rocky Mountains, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. It led to the recovery of gray wolves in the Great Lake states, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan. It led to a hope for recovery of the Mexican gray wolf, Canis lupus balei, in the southwest. And so today, today, there would probably be, let me see here, let's assume 5,000 or so gray wolves in north in the Great Lake states and, and 2,000 gray wolves in the northern Rocky Mountains and about 150 Mexican wolves in the border country. That would give us well, a little over 7,000 animals that have been recovered across about uh, 15% of the species historical range. That's good progress. It certainly does not detract from the fact, though, 
that the gray wolf remains extirpated from approximately 85% of its historical range. The, the destruction of the gray wolf was a, like the American Plains bison, like the passenger pigeon, represents a very, very sad chapter in the history of this country. I was um, noting that the government's outright campaign of extermination against the gray wolf officially ended in the 1960s. And since that time, restoration projects have popped up across the West, like the infamous program in Yellowstone National Park in 1995. But despite these efforts, I think that these notions of proper cultivation, civilization, and domination over all that is wild continue to live on in our collective American imagery, particularly in the West. And I wonder how you see this era of human supremacy continue to play out in our cultural and policy handlings with the gray wolf. Uh, I don't think it's a cultural predisposition to treat some wildlife with total disregard. I think it is a principally a consequence of one camp. And, and as a biologist, your listeners need to know, I, I am, I'm a big believer that our evolutionary past matters. I think you are Pleistocene woman. I am Pleistocene man. Our Pleistocene roots made us who we are today. We can't deny the fact that for most of our evolutionary past, we existed in small bands of hunter-gatherers. For heaven's sakes, agriculture hasn't been practiced for more than about 8,000 years, and yet you can find clear evidence of sapiens, homo sapiens, walking this planet 200,000 years ago, 300,000 years ago. Let's assume that our evolutionary clock started 250,000 years ago. And over the last 8,000 years, we've been able to grow crops and take advantage of domesticated animals, which means over 200 some thousand years of our evolutionary past, we were hunter-gatherers, Pleistocene men and women. They were decidedly tribal, very social with one another, but very, very tribal. That's how we survived. I think we're still tribal. And so I, I will have you believe that the principal problem of disregard for wildlife is a, principally a function of one tribe. And I can pick at this tribe because it's my tribe. It's the old white guy tribe. It's the old white guys that still insist that we dominate landscapes. It's the old white guy tribe that insists that we kill wildlife needlessly. Just a story to that effect. In the last legislative session in early 2019, I brought a bill to the Montana Senate that said, we're gonna prohibit the killing of coyotes by snowmobiles. In the state of Montana, you can hunt a coyote off a snowmobile. You can run it and you can run it and you can run it. You can run it so long and so hard that the coyote just drops with exhaustion. It's not dead. It's just so pooped it can't move. At that point, you can use your snowmobile to run it over repeatedly to kill it. In other words, you're, it's lawful to torture the coyote to death. I said with my bill, we're better than that, folks. We should pass a bill that says you can't torture the coyote to death. At the point of killing the animal, you have to deliver the death blow humanely. You run it to the point of exhaustion. At that point, you have to shoot it or kill it somehow quickly and humanely. You can't run it over repeatedly with your snowmobile. Well, the bill did not make it out of the Senate Fish and Game Committee. So I said, okay, okay. All right. I, as any senator, I then had the option to go to the full Senate and say with a motion, I move to remove my coyote killing bill from the Fish and Game Committee and bring it to the full Senate uh, for a proper discussion. So when it got stuck in committee, I was going to blast my bill from the committee for consideration by the full Senate. Before I did that, a few days before I did that, I went to my uh, colleagues on the Republican side of the aisle and I said, please help me with this blast motion. You may ultimately choose to vote against the bill but let's at least have a proper discussion. Montana is better than allowing coyotes to be tortured to death. So I stand up two days later on the Senate floor and I say, uh, Mr. Chairman, I move to remove uh, Senate Bill 212 from the Senate Fish and Game Committee and bring it before the full Senate for consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As is the habit, then the chairman says, Senator Phillips, 
and I have a moment or two to speak on the rationale of my blast motion. So I said to the, my colleagues in the Senate, I said, members of the Senate, this is an important bill. We should consider it as a full body. Uh, as you consider that, note that if we knew, if we knew of a, of a 12-year-old boy in our neighborhoods that was using his bicycle to run over the local cat, uh, we would be deeply concerned for that young boy's mental health. This is no different than that. Please vote for this blast motion so we can properly consider this bill. At that point, Ayanna, we voted, and my blast motion failed on a party line vote. 18 Democrats, myself and my 17 colleagues, voted yes. 32 Republicans voted no. I was deeply embarrassed by that vote. I had served with many of these people for 14 years. I knew them. I considered them colleagues. I considered some friends. I was asking something very simple. Let's not torture coyotes to death. And they, they said, no, they wouldn't even they wouldn't even join me to stand up and at least have a discussion. Ayana, at that point, at that point, I, I could no longer pray with them. A every day when the Montana Senate begins its work, and I, I don't know what other state legislatures do, but I know what we do. Every day we would stand and we would pray and then pledge allegiance to the flag and then begin our work. From that day forward, at the beginning of any session, I would step out into the ante room and I would stand quietly and uh, wait for the prayer to end. And then I would step back into the chamber and I would pledge allegiance and I would take my seat. I, I could no longer, I could no longer pray with my colleagues and my friends because I could no longer accept their hypocrisy. I'm quite confident that God holds coyotes in high regard and would not want his coyotes to be tortured to death. It's the old white guy tribe I know, that, that continues to get in the way because we have this gross inability to accommodate wild and self-willed nature. Oh my goodness, Mike. Your story touched me so much. And oh, I just am taking a moment to let your response sit. And I want to tell you in this moment that I am so grateful for you and I respect you so much for your courage and your convictions. You're really such a unique person. <laughs> and I think a lot about this typical American Western identity, or as you put it, this white man tribe identity. And you know, it's as one that has been foraged around a shared sense of pride and wilderness and outdoorsmanship and a settler mentality of conquest and rugged individualism. And I feel a sense of hollowness around this profession of belonging and ownership. The grizzly bear that remains at the center of the California flag, but only in its symbolic form. As this species has vanished from our forested landscapes, our mountains, our waters, and these creatures remain at the center of our collective mythology, but they're simultaneously revered and hated. And just listening to your your stories and and how you are connected so deeply to the land and these creatures, it gives me pause. And I just want to say thank you before we continue well, on. Yeah, you're welcome. I wish I was more effective, uh, but... I learned a long time ago I can't be responsible for other people's decisions. I can barely figure out how to make my own decisions. <laughs> and I, I will say that we sometimes celebrate wildness and symbols only, the grizzly bear and the California flag, in part because we're increasingly living in a world of ecological illiterates. People don't understand that everything that we need, and when you cut it deep enough, Everybody needs food, cover, water, space. Uh, all, all living organisms in one form or fashion need food, cover, water, space. Most people today, 99.999% of the people today, buy what they need. You buy food, cover, water, space. There's not enough subsistence hunters left in the world to matter in a numerical sense. Everybody's buying food, cover, water, space. So the marketplace really matters. And yet, we place so much emphasis on the marketplace that we forget that it sits on landscapes the world over. 
Absent healthy landscapes the world over, marketplaces struggle. If marketplaces struggle, all of those of us who buy our food, cover, water, space, have no choice but to struggle too. We are burdened with ecological illiteracy. I'm on with you today because I think these types of podcasts can promote literacy. And I think from uh, the perspective of living in greater harmony with one another and Mother Earth, we need to be more literate. Mm -hmm. I absolutely agree with you, Mike. And uh, yeah, there's so much to say about that. And I feel like it's also impossible. Well, but there's things, and mm -hmm. well, but there's things to do. There's things that mm -hmm. we should. I mean, I, I, I'm not guided by despair. I'm guided by hope. But my hope is guided by what I think are good facts rooted in reality. Like many people don't understand how systems operate. They don't understand the importance of wild and self-willed nature to humankind's future. I am guided by a determination to try to contribute to a better way forward. So I don't want the listeners to get down in the dumps. I'm sorry I shared my, my coyote story and my inability to pray, but it drives home the fact that nearly everybody that voted against my coyote bill, well, on the Republican side of the aisle in the 2019 session in Montana, they were all old white guys except one woman, I'm sorry, two women and one Native American. So the 38 of them, 35 were old white guys. It's impossible to tell these stories without calling upon the colonial roots of land management in the U.S. that have perpetrated egregious acts of violence, often in the name of conservation itself. And I feel like you were speaking a bit to this at the beginning of our conversation. The wars waged against gray wolf, the grizzly, the coyote, the buffalo have also been wars against the indigenous peoples that have actively tended the lands and waters of Turtle Island since the beginning of time. In what is now Yellowstone National Park, for example, the U.S. Army was stationed from 1886 to 1918 and forcibly displaced the Awanichi from their tribal homelands. This logic of extermination that sought to sever the sacred bonds of life in these places paved the way for the construction of untouched, quote-unquote, wilderness for the exclusive use of recreation, mass tourism, and resource extraction. So do you see indigenous sovereignty as an important thread to weave into a new model of conservation? And how can these lineages of violence inform how we go about protecting spaces in the future? Well, certainly I agree that indigenous sovereignty matters. If sovereignty has to matter or nations all across the planet don't have sufficient standing. In our own small way, a team turner, we're working to promote, for example, bison restoration on tribal lands throughout the United States as a celebration of the tribe's sovereignty or create a future of their own making. And ideally, that future would include plains bison as a fixed feature on their landscapes. How does that translate into more open lands conservation, if that was your question? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I think that, that large-scale changes changes that operate at sufficient scale to matter 
have to be effective through a political process. As, as much as I regret my ineffectiveness as a politician, I have thought long and hard about the great collective endeavor that is politics in the United States and, and accepting for the marketplace. I don't know of any greater collective human endeavor across the long sweep of our history than politics. It, it's, it's how we move forward when we were small bands of hunter-gatherers. It's how we move forward as great nations of people. And I would hope that your listeners, if they're committed to a more peaceful, prosperous, and just future for human and non-human life, they would consider putting their name on the ballot and running for office. Many of the issues that touch on peace, prosperity, and justice for human and non-human life are not properly considered in a political context today because people serving aren't sensitive to the issues. One that has guided our work at the Turner Endangered Species Fund and certainly guides our work to advance wolf recovery to Western Colorado, which is the next great and probably the last great restoration campaign for the gray wolf in the United States is acknowledgement of the increasing seriousness of the extinction crisis. Now, Ayanna, when you think about that, it is a most unique circumstance. It is truly a crisis of the most damning kind. We know from history that along the big sweep of time that this planet has supported multicellular life, well, let's say 300 million years, 400 million years, there have been prior to the current extinction crisis, five previous such events. The fifth occurred about 65 million years ago when a, an asteroid measuring something like six miles across and traveling at something like 25,000 miles an hour slammed into the planet off of the coast of what is now the Yucatan Peninsula. And fundamentally, in a geologic instant, ended the reign of the dinosaurs. Well, the, the sixth crisis is now in place. It's been in place at least since the Industrial Revolution in the late 1700s. Probably, technically, we can find evidence of the crisis dating back centuries, uh, if not thousands of years before that. Uh, humankind has always been hard on the planet and the non-human components of life. So when you think about the extinction crisis, I, I would have you believe it's the clarion call for recognizing a need to adjust our relationship with Mother Earth because it is so absolute. There, there is no workaround to the extinction crisis. It's, it is patently absolute. Another heaven and earth would have to pass along with a great deal of luck for any extinct species to ever rise again. That makes it, I think, a clarion call. And, and it's also a clarion call because it should matter no matter who you are, no matter who you are, the extinction crisis should matter. So let's assume you're a person of faith. Well, I would pose the question, how can you love the creator and not love the creation? And if, and if you love something, how can you stand by and watch it needlessly destroyed without rising up in defense? Or, or let's assume uh, for, for a moment that you're a secular humanist. And rather than faith, you believe that what matters most is facts and data and logic and empiricism. Well, the best science tells us that the fate of humanity has always been and will always be connected to the health of local landscapes the world over. Well, the extinction crisis makes clear that those landscapes are not the least bit healthy. No matter who you are, the extinction crisis should matter. Mm hmm Yes, I'm with you, Mike. I'd also be curious to hear about your thoughts around a future of coexistence with gray wolves. And I know this can be an incredibly polarizing issue, especially on the front lines of reintroduction projects where people have competing visions of land use, whether towards conservation, hunting, or livestock production. And as an advocate for the gray wolf within this highly debated arena, how do you present the case of restoration to people who perhaps feel fearful or in defense of their safety and livelihood? And what is needed to ultimately reconcile these differences? Gray wolves are actually 
really easy to coexist with. The only thing that's ever gotten in the way of wolf recovery, the only thing that stands as an obstacle to coexisting with gray wolves is the mythical wolf. People have this sense that gray wolves have an almost supernatural ability to exercise their predatory will on a whim. And, and by doing so, they create a wake of death and desolation and destruction everywhere they go. Oh, gee was nothing could be further from the truth. For the gray wolf, life is a daily struggle to survive. Most hunting attempts by gray wolves fail. Starvation is a common cause of death. Hunting is a dangerous activity. I did a study years ago of over 200 gray wolf skulls that had been collected by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. These were animals that Alaska Department of Fish and Game had shot in an attempt to minimize predation pressure on a local caribou herd or a local moose population. So these animals were killed by being shot. I looked at their skulls for evidence of blunt force trauma. How often did they get kicked in the head by a moose, for example? Fully a quarter of the skull showed a broken jaw, broken nose, broken skull. A good friend of mine, Rolf Peterson, Dr. Peterson from Michigan Technological University in Houghton, Michigan, has studied gray wolves on uh, Royal National Park since 1972. Rolf has never done a necropsy of a gray wolf. A necropsy is just an autopsy of an animal. He's never, never done a necropsy of a gray wolf from Isle Royal that has not shown evidence of blunt force trauma, a broken leg, broken rib, broken nose. It's very difficult to make a living in the woods with your teeth. But people are unwilling to accept that fact. They are more willing to embrace the mythical wolf, this devil uh, incarnate that exercises its predatory will on a whim. Unfortunately, the myth is as strong as it is wrong. As I said, life is a daily struggle for the real wolf. The real wolf on a, and reliable data collected over decades. The gray wolf is one of the most studied large mammals in the world. We know a lot about gray wolves. We know without doubt, gray wolves do not represent a threat to human safety. They do not represent a threat to the livestock industry. They do not represent a threat to the big game hunting industry. Gray wolves are really if you're willing to embrace an honest portrayal of the species, uh, gray wolves are relatively easy to coexist with when problems do arise. Uh, we have very good tools at the ready for resolving conflicts and very good tools at the ready for preventing conflicts. It's the mythical wolf that gets in the way of the future of the real wolf. Mm -hmm. I can absolutely see that. I really appreciate your deep understanding of this issue and how you're able to speak with so much compassion to the many sides of this complex topic. I'd also like to take a step back and look at this from more of a systemic level. An article published in National Geographic by Emma Maris reports that, quote, today, only 4% of the world's mammals by weight are wild. The other 96% are livestock and ourselves, end quote. And this statistics illustrates such a staggering image of our biosphere, and I think speaks to the way industry has privileged certain species over the lives of many others, creating landscapes stripped of all biological diversity purely for human consumption of one kind or another. So could you speak to the ways that cattle ranching and grazing rights have been prioritized both in the past and present terms? Well, uh, we've already spoken about them destruction of the Plains bison. That was very much justified on the grounds that the grasslands needed to provide forage for European cattle. We spoke about the destruction of the gray wolf. It was the cattlemen that developed a pathological hatred of the gray wolf to make room for European cattle. The grizzly bear was pushed to the brink of extinction in the United States to make room for cattle. Uh, even to this day, even to this day, Predators continue to be persecuted to make room for cattle. We have achieved recovery in both a biological and legal sense for the gray wolf in the northern Rocky Mountains, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho. But we continue to persecute them with a great deal of determination. In, in Montana, as an example, uh, there may be 
oh, eight or 900 gray wolves that live in the western quarter of our great state. Every year, eight or 900 animals. In an average year, oh, gee whiz, uh, up to 300 of those animals are killed. I, I saw some data recently that indicated the average age of a gray wolf in Montana, outside of highly protected areas like Yellowstone Park, the average age of a gray wolf is about three years. My Lord, three years is nothing. A gray wolf, if left to her own devices and not killed by people, would live to be eight or nine or maybe 10. You know, they don't live for that long, but they certainly have capacity to live longer than three years. The biggest hurdle to wolf recovery in Western Colorado and when people think about it, it is tremendous opportunity. Western Colorado is God's gift to gray wolves. Over 17 million acres of federal public lands across which gray wolves will receive priority consideration. A robust prey population consisting of deer and elk, unlike anything in the world, anything in the world. Reliable studies clearly indicate Western Colorado could support a viable population of gray wolves. That population is mandated. The existence of that population is mandated by the Federal Endangered Species Act. It's also mandated in a softer fashion, but nonetheless mandated by state law. And yet it's principally the livestock industry that stands in opposition because they just can't imagine how their operations could be conducted in wolf country, even though many of their operations are based on federal public lands, and they're already heavily subsidized to use those lands. We, we don't charge public land ranchers an amount of money for the grass that their livestock consumes that's actually equal to what that grass is worth. We, we as a country have said, oh, we're not going to charge you what the grass is worth because we recognize ranching in remote western rangelands owned by the federal government. That's a tough business. That's a risky proposition. So we're gonna we're gonna help by charging you a fraction of what that grass is actually worth. And still that helping hand is not enough. It's not enough. They would rather the landscapes be wolfless. They they don't want Another challenge, even though we know from reliable studies conducted over decades that it's the atypical wolf that depredates on livestock, we know that in the northern Rocky Mountains, nearly 100% of the livestock that would call Montana home, nearly 100%, 99.995% of those livestock will never be involved in a wolf depredation. The depredations are so uncommon to be of little interest to the industry. Now, if you're the rancher who lost a cow last night, you've got a problem. And I readily acknowledge that. But as I said, fortunately, we've got good tools at the ready for resolving such conflicts when they do occur. Very good tools at the ready for preventing such conflicts from ever occurring in the first place. You know, we can put an astronaut on the moon and bring her home. We can take your heart out of your chest and put it back better than before. I promise you we can coexist with the gray wolf. But the livestock industry stands in sharp opposition. So we continue to bow down to the great hamburger. <laughs> oh, Mike, I really appreciate those metaphors. I'm wondering as we wrap up this part of the conversation around gray wolves, I'd be curious to hear about what kind of future path you envision for gray wolf reintroduction and any updates surrounding your partnership with Rocky Mountain Wolf Project in Western Colorado? Yes, and, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Of course. Yeah, the, the, the folks need to know there's this tremendous effort brewing to restore gray wolves to Western Colorado. It's been underway for many years. It is now very muscular, very capable. It is predisposed to succeed. It's, it's represented by two organizations that have related but different uh, roles. The first organization is Rocky Mountain Wolf Project. The website is just rockymountainwolfproject.org. The project is a coalition of conservation visionaries and conservation organizations that believe that if Coloradans simply embraced an honest portrayal of the gray wolf, they would conclude that coexisting with the species is a straightforward affair that requires only a modicum of accommodation. That conclusion, of course, advances restoration. 
But by itself, that conclusion is probably not enough to affect change. So the Rocky Mountain Wolf Project stands alongside what could be seen as a companion organization known as the Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund. That website is just www.wolfactionfund.com. The Rocky Mountain Wolf Action Fund is a political organization. It's not a coalition. It is a lean, mean, fighting political machine that aims to allow Coloradans to decide if the wolf has a future across the great public wildlands of Western Colorado by vote. The Action Fund intends to place a wolf restoration initiative on the 2020 general election ballot and let Coloradans decide by November of 2020 whether the wolf should be a part of the state's great future. The uh, project has done well educating, drawing attention to the real wolf. The Action Fund has done well advancing the political campaign to give Coloradans a chance to vote. Now, listeners might say, well, that's great for Colorado, but what does that have to do with me? Well, really, the Wolf Action Fund is launching a national campaign to use direct democracy to elect the wolf to restore the wolf. And the reason it's a national campaign is that the the gray wolf, Canis lupus, remains fully protected under federal law. Consequently, Americans all over the country have the right, uh, some would say the responsibility to concern themselves with the future of the gray wolf in places like Western Colorado. And the second reason that the Wolf Action Fund is launching a nationwide campaign is that the landscape of relevance to wolf restoration in Western Colorado is federal public lands. Americans all over the country can fairly claim ownership of the San Juan National Forest in southwestern Colorado, for example. So because the gray wolf is considered protected by federal law, and because the landscape, restoration landscape of relevance is federal public lands, uh, Americans all across the country can choose to engage. They, They won't be able to vote, that's true, but they could choose to offer support in the form of uh, donations, in the form of moral support, in the form of intellectual support. It is a nationwide campaign. There are people all over the country uh, that are going to rise up, rise up in support of the ecological integrity of the federal public lands of Western Colorado that can be improved with the restoration of the endangered gray wolf. Sometimes my love may be put on Sometimes my heart may seem awful cold These times come, these times go As long as I live, all you need to know is It's so dark, it ain't about to all we've had and all that's next as long as my heart beating in my chest it's so dark ain't about to forget now Mike Faced with a constant deluge of shocking reports and articles, I think it can be easy to numb ourselves to all of the loss that we're facing on a planetary scale at this time. And that said, I want to take a moment to name the current extinction crisis and voice the gravity of living in this time of the Anthropocene. I'll read a short passage from The Song of the Dodo, a beautiful and tragic book by David Quammen. Quote, The song of the dodo, if it had one, is forever unknowable because no human from whom we have testimony ever took the trouble to sit in the Mauritian forest and listen, end quote. And I could ask you to recount more scientific data or name the species that sit atop the endangered species list, but I'd really like to ask you as someone who has their heart and hands on the ground, what are you listening to right now? And what messages from the non-human realm 
are emerging in the stillness? And maybe a second part of that question is, what brings you energy to continue on in the struggle and fight to make spaces for these species in our human-centered world? Well, first, let me say thank you for reading from Song of the Dodo. David Quammen is a good pal of mine. He uh, lives down the street from me, and I hold David in very high regard. Song of the Dodo is a fantastic and important book, so thank you for drawing attention to it. You said, what am I listening to? I assume that you mean in the form of a podcast or but well, I, I actually meant what are you listening to in in the stillness of uh, well, that was uh, in the non human? Oh, oh, great. Okay. Yeah, mostly I, I try to sit and and listen to the natural world. I, I don't I don't find much satisfaction in TV uh, movies. I, I I pretty much just watch things that are funny, or at least things that aim to be funny. I, I think laughter is important. Uh, I think being able to see ourselves in a realistic light and not take ourselves too terribly seriously is important for plowing ahead. And uh, I enjoy music, but I really enjoy sitting quietly and and listening to just the sounds of nature. One of the most important things that me and my family do at certain times of the year, the Flying D Ranch is just about 25 minutes from our home here in Bozeman, and we'll go out to the Flying D Ranch. It supported the Bear Trap Pack of Wolves since about 2003. The Bear Trap Pack of Wolves is uh, one of the largest packs of wolves in North America, consistently about 20 animals strong. We know a lot about the bear trap pack and we know where they den and we know where they raise their puppies. And so we can go out in July and August and September and sit on the hillside. And inevitably, if we're patient, as day gives way to the evening, they'll howl. And I, I am just always moved. I like seeing gray wolves. That's fun. That's cool. But boy, oh boy, I really like hearing them howl. It's one of the great sounds of wild and self-willed nature, like the call of a loon or, or a bugling elk. Some sounds just affirm that Mother Nature got it right without much help of any from us so very long ago. We are and have been for a long time a big ecological disaster, we being humanity, because we have such a rapacious appetite for dominating and and consuming things. So I I certainly like to sit quietly and listen to nature, and it can be in my backyard. It doesn't have to be on the Flying Bee Ranch. But uh, in terms of listening, a a little story that your listeners might enjoy. Uh, uh, Two years ago, me and my family were honored to be able to camp for a long weekend on on Peel Island. Peel Island is this tiny sort of dot of isolation and magic in the southern part of Yellowstone Lake. First day out as the setting sun was giving way to a rising moon, we heard the howl of a a lone wolf. It was... uh, she howled. I, I, I don't know the gender necessarily, but it's my story. And so I wouldn't believe it was a female. And so I'm going to say she howled. She howled all night long. It, that never was a response, which I found intriguing. It's hard to be a gray wolf under the best of circumstances. It's especially hard to be a, a lone wolf. It was clear to me she was searching for some kind of companionship. More than once, I crawled out of my tent, and my sleeping bag and howled back. I, I've howled at a lot of gray wolves in my day, but on that particular night, it just didn't seem to be the thing to do. So I stayed in my tent and I stayed in my sleeping bag and I listened and I reflected. And, and as I did, you know, I, I, I came to wonder if, if all these many years, these decades, these centuries, Mother Earth has been howling to us, hoping for us to respond by affirming her importance, hoping for us to respond by rising up in the defense of the defenseless parts of nature. As I as I laid there and thought about that, as is my habit, my thoughts then drifted from conservation science to politics, and I was reminded of some very important words that were uttered by Congressman John Lewis. Congressman Lewis was a contemporary of Martin Luther King and was an important senior cardinal figure in the civil rights movement. At one point, as Congressman Lewis was fighting for the rights of the oppressed, He uttered words that now have as much meaning to the non-human world as they did back in the day when Lewis was fighting for the rights of people. And he said quite simply, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? And so when you ask me what I'm listening to, what I think about, I think about rising up now, using my time to rise up and do what I can to fight for those among us 
that are unable to defend themselves. Thank you, Mike, for sharing that story. And I feel very aligned with that. One of the challenges we ask ourselves daily at For the Wild is how we can help our listeners become more active participants and resilient earth defenders. We're constantly orienting and reorienting within this question to try and figure out how we can bridge a connection of caring to what might otherwise feel like distant lands or distant problems. As such a fierce advocate for imperiled species and a public servant, I'd like to turn this question back to you. How have you sought to inspire your constituents to care differently and tune into the multiplicity of beyond human worlds that turn alongside our own human experience? And how do you feel like people can continue or just begin to be more active participants and earth defenders? I think the problems are now so systemic that nothing less than a grand systemic solution will suffice. And I know of only two encompassing activities that could bring about the types of systemic solutions that will make planet a more peaceful, prosperous, and just place for human and non-human life. And, and the one that matters here today is politics. Uh, I'm proud to have served in elected office. I still sit in my state senate seat. I'll hold that seat to the end of 2020 when I'll be term limited. That will rent end of 14 years of service as a state legislator. I'm proud. I don't see politics as a problem. I see politics as an important part of the solution of moving us as a collective forward to a better place. So I would say to the listeners, become more involved in the political process. Insist that candidates are aware of the extinction crisis. They're, they're aware of the climate change crisis, that they're aware of the pressing need for a new energy future, that they're aware of the fact that the fate of humanity has always rested on the health of local landscapes. Insist that the cost of an item is accounted for today fully. The cost of production, consumption, and distribution is accounted for fully. So we're not passing to future generations a bill that we should have paid long ago. And the best way, I think, to move forward, and I will challenge your female listeners, we need more women in decision-making positions. The world will be a more peaceful, prosperous, and just place if women rise up and say to the old white guy tribe, you've had access to the power levels long enough long enough, get the hell out of the way, because now we're going to take over because you don't have the skill set that is needed to bring people together to go forward and celebrate a future that is more peaceful and more prosperous and more just. Serve in elected office, put your name on a ballot, get behind candidates, drill down in the electoral process, contribute to this country by serving as an informed voter. And if you can, put your name on a ballot and recognize that this country needs more women leaders. <laughs> I wish you could see my face as you were saying that. <laughs> I was grinning from well, ear to ear. Thank you. I can tell you, I was so proud. I was so proud in the in the Senate, state Senate here in Montana. We were in a deep minority hall. That's true. There were only 18 of us. There were 32 of our colleagues on the Republican side. But of the 18, of the 18 Democrats, 12 were women. And I was so honored to serve in a caucus that was guided by such a steady hand and thoughtfulness. Mm. And uh, I am convinced that this country will do better when we have more women in positions of decision-making. So can I end with a joke? Oh gosh, <laughs> let's, please. Let's end with a joke. Okay. <laughs> Here's my only, my only endangered species joke, and it will be my final word. But that was some time ago, there was some time ago, two condors flying around. And of course, condors are scavengers they're flying around and they they see this clown this clown had died on the side of a road and as condors do they flew down and they landed and they began eating on this clown because that's what scavengers do and after a few minutes one condor said to the other condor does this taste funny to you <laughs> that's the joke it was a clown right it was a clown does this taste funny to you? <laughs> come on come on my god <laughs> Thank you for making us laugh but, because I agree we need we do need laughter in this time, and I, I, yes, I appreciate that. And Mike, this has been so wonderful to have you on the show, and I think we're all going to garner so much from hearing your words. So thank you so much. Well, it has been my privilege and my honor. Thank you so much for the chance to uh, contribute. Thank you for listening to another episode of For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. 
The music you heard today was from Mac DeMarco. I'd like to thank our wonderful podcast production team, Aidan McRae, Andrew Stores, Cameron Stallones, Carter Lou McElroy, Erica Ekram, Aaron Wise, Francesca Glassbell, Hannah Wilton, and Melanie Younger.